Um, I realize that I'm probably the only thing standing between everyone and drinks or dinner, so <laughs> the last session of the day, the, the, uh, the enviable spot. Um, my name is Matt Schlesman. I'm with Blink Reaction. Um, we're gonna, I'll, I'll give a little bit of introduction here in a minute in terms of who Blink Reaction is. Um, just some quick background on myself because I'm gonna, I want to talk a little bit about today about why the enterprise needs Drupal and why I feel that Drupal needs the enterprise. And this is all from, from my perspective. Um, my background, I've, I've been in technology working with you know, software and technology and services firms for about 16 years. Um, Historically, most of the work that I'd done had been at enterprise software companies with proprietary um, uh, software solutions. I was introduced to Drupal about four plus years ago and, and got engaged. My first DrupalCon was DrupalCon San Francisco. And um, I've certainly, it's been a great experience. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and uh, it's, it's been, uh, in, in a lot of ways, eye-opening and very refreshing. So um, I want to weave and give you some perspective um, just from, from my perspective in terms of what I've seen in working with enterprise customers and enterprise accounts, but also what I've seen in terms of Drupal and the impact that Drupal can have in those organizations and vice versa. So uh, I'd, I'd certainly, uh, any, at any point, you can feel free to uh, interrupt me if you have questions or, or any points you'd like me to expand on further. Um, I do want to keep this interactive, so we're going to have a couple of points where where everybody can jump in and, and throw out some ideas or some, some feedback, so stay tuned. And you know, just to keep everybody uh, enticed, we've got some, some free giveaways here, some Reese's Peanut Butter Cups if, uh, if you contribute and, uh, and, and uh, offer some ideas. So with that, we'll, we'll jump right in. I'm going to start by uh, giving a little shameless plug for Blink Reaction and who we are. Um, I run sales at Blink Reaction, so I'm more than happy to... To, to provide you with some context on, on what we do. So Blink Reaction, we are an enterprise Drupal consultancy. Um, we are, are focused on Drupal and delivering great solutions on Drupal, both great customer and user experiences, great uh, high-performing solutions, but also great customer experiences in terms of our customers that we're, we're developing the sites for and building the sites with. Um, we're a global organization, so we're based out of uh, New Jersey, um, just outside the New York metro area. And we have another office up in the Cambridge area, just outside of Boston, as well as a number of remote employees around the United States, as well as uh, we also have some offices in Europe, um, distributed throughout various regions in Europe. At, at our core, our core competency is Drupal. Um, so we've been working with Drupal since back in the days of Drupal 4. Um, to date, we've built just over, I think, a, a thousand sites in Drupal 7. That's between new sites that we've built as well as sites we've migrated. We've run into some situations where we've got customers we worked with where we migrated hundreds of sites at just those, those individual customers. Um, we've been involved in some very, very high traffic Drupal implementations. We've done you know, some great work with, with customers um, like, like NBC Sports in terms of uh, working on some of the Olympic sites with them. A uh, lot of high traffic activity on those sites. We've done some great work around sites like the 9-11 Memorial site. Um, the, around the 10th anniversary of 9-11, ton of traffic, ton of activity pushed to that site, a ton of page views. So um, we understand what it takes to, to implement sites that perform and scale, but also deliver a great experience. Um, we're, we're very focused on, on high return. So um, one thing that, that I think is near and dear to everyone's heart at Blink is m making sure that we deliver on time and on budget. You know, I've worked with a lot of enterprises um, in my experience, in, again, in, in a variety of different capacities. But at the end of the day, if you're engaging with a customer and one of those two things is missing, either you know, you're on budget but you're not on time or you're on time and you're not on budget, that is never a, never a good situation. So those two things are near and dear to our heart. And we're able to accomplish that through very, very seamless project management and through a very structured methodology that we approach engagements with. Um, we also, a key component of our, our offering is also providing training. So uh, Ray Saltini, who's here in the audience, uh, runs our Blink Institute. I'm not sure some of you may have had an opportunity to uh, attend some training that Ray did here just yesterday. Um, I think it was focused around Symphony, um, some Symphony training, and we're going to be doing a lot of, of training and coordination with Sensio Labs coming up, so we're pretty excited about that. But we offer training across a, a variety of different capacities, you know, content editors, um, content administrators, all the way to you know, uh, site administrators, developers, and everything in between. So, um, When we talk about the, the spectrum of the services that we offer at Blink, 
we, we offer kind of the front end aspects of engaging around creative and user experience. Um, we do provide consulting around Drupal architecture, continuous integration, best practices, things of that nature. Um, the bread and butter of our business is Drupal development, custom integrations, and then rounded out again by, as I mentioned before, the Blink Institute and the training and education that we can offer. Um, I mentioned, you know, kind of informing what I'm going to talk about today is really a lot of the work that I've had the opportunity to do in, in engaging with various enterprise customers. Uh, Blink certainly has engaged with a lot of great, great organizations, great enterprises. Um, you can see some of those represented up here. Um, and some of these we worked in, you know, engaged with uh, as, as the, in the sole delivery uh, for that customer. And in other situations, we've been working with partners. I even see, you know, some of our partners here in the audience today, like, uh, like VML, and we've been working with them at Whole Foods. Um, so some great things going on. So with that, we'll jump right into the content for the session today. The shameless plug is over. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Drupal in the enterprise. And I thought the way we'd start this off is by thinking about personas. So anybody familiar with user-centered development, in development of personas, right? Great. So you guys are going to be really good at this. Um, so we're going to start off first with, let's talk about the persona of the Drupalist. Right? So as I was trying to think of, okay, you know, who's a good sort of um, representative uh, for, for the Drupalist? Well, that's an easy one, right? I'll pick Therese. He's nice and easy. So tell me, what are some characteristics of the Drupalist? I'll, I'll take any ideas that folks want to throw out. Um, and remember, there's free candy. So commitment to the platform. Okay. That's, there you go. Peanut butter cup. Yeah. Vision. Okay. And remember, I think, think more broadly too about this. This is any Drupalist, right? What are, what are the characteristics of the Drupalist? What are, what are things that are important to Drupalists? Community. You already got it. I'll give you another one if you want. <laughs> Community. That, I think that's key. What else? Quality. Yeah, I like who said that. Oh, I, you know. I, I'll give it a shot. You ready? Oh, good catch. Good catch. I've been coaching my son's Little League team this year, so working on my pitching. I like quality, yeah. Transparency. Transparency. I like that. All right, here you go. Almost got it there. Any others? Reuse. Reuse. Okay. Good. All right. So I think I, I actually gave this some thought as well in terms of what, what are some of the values of, of a Drupalist. And I think there's some good overlap between some of the things that just came out of the discussion and, and some of the ideas I came up with as well. I think, you know, community, first and foremost. I mean, look, look at what we're all doing here, right? The DrupalCon events, Drupal meetups, um, uh, Drupal.org, there's, there's so many examples of, of why community is important to the Drupalist and the Drupal community. We see it, we see it every day. Um, I think I'll be honest, I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of folks that are excited to be a part of the Drupal community, and it's important to them that they're getting exposed to cool technology. I mean, I'm walking through some of these sessions, and people are excited to hear about, hey, tell me about this new module you built, or tell me about um, how, you, how, you, uh, how you set up a site to do this. And um, the technology is, you know, as you think about the Drupalist, right, you have different types of, of Drupalists, you know, people who do it as their day job, but then you also have people who, you know, they have another day job that might be unrelated and they're going home in their nights and evenings and they're, you know, getting engaged in the community and they're working on Drupal. Um, you know, they're, the, the technology piece, I think, is, is something that, you know, gets, gets people excited and keeps them engaged. Um, most, most Drupalists that I've known are excited, and most developers I've known, are excited about solving problems, right? Some people are excited to solve very, very difficult problems. And other people, maybe the really, really difficult problems, not so much, but they like generally solving problems. And, um, you know, they find that rewarding and satisfying. And so I think that's, to me, that's, that's something that's a value that, that, you know, aligns well to Drupalists. And then, you know, I, I always sense when I'm engaging with folks in the Drupal community, and especially here at DrupalCon, making a difference is, is always something that's kind of a core value and is important to people. 
And you know, what does that mean? Well, making a difference can happen on a number of levels. You know, maybe it's helping somebody out in the community, somebody who's coming up to speed on Drupal or learning Drupal. Maybe it's you know writing or contributing a module or or you know contributing a patch to fix it or resolve an issue with with something that's out there. But but being able to somehow make an impact, and that impact can actually be broader than just some of those point examples. You know, making an impact to provide something that you know makes a difference in in people's lives. I I think. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's being able to work on something and deliver something that's of value, right? It's it's got value, and I'm not talking monetary value necessarily, but it's delivering some value in some way to individuals or to people or to to others. So, um, so I think there's some good alignment. You know, it's not necessarily 100% overlap, but some good alignment with with some of these things that I was independently thinking about as well in terms of the the Drupalist and the persona of the Drupalist. So. So now we're going to talk about the enterprise, and you know, for my my persona, the enterprise. Anybody know who this is? No one. Uh, you're right, she does. So it's Meg Whitman. So Meg was the CEO of eBay, and and is now the CEO of HP. Um, you know, she certainly is. Uh, uh, you know, as I thought about a face that I could put up here, a face that would identify with the enterprise. You know, I was kind of torn between Meg Whitman and Jack Walsh, but Jack Walsh retired. Right, so, or Jack Welsh. Jack Welsh retired from GE, so Meg Whitman is our face of the enterprise today. So let's let's now talk a little bit about the enterprise and what are some things that you know when you think about a business or an enterprise, what are some things that are important to an enterprise? Scalability. Scalability. Right. Want another one? Sure. All right. Yep. It's through dinner. Control. Yes. Control. Yes. Absolutely. Support, yeah. All right. Yes. Security. Security. All right. Did I get it there? I'm gonna switch to overhand. Cost. What's that? Cost. Cost. Yep. Pointing vendor lock-in. Pointing vendor lock-in. One of them. Oh. Okay. Any others? SLAs. SLAs. Okay. Yep. No need. No need. You're good. 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 Any others? Come on. Somebody else must want to Reese's cup. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe even yeah, yeah. So, so taking that and um, I kind of went through the same exercise, right? I, I sat down and um, ate a few Reese's cups and had a little time to think about this. It was probably before. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So my definition of an enterprise would be, a, how would I define it? A business or an organization, right? That is is looking at and evaluating technology and is and is looking at leveraging Drupal for some some business means. How is that different from a free store? It's not. Can't, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. But I also think. Well, let me let me actually let me step back. The needs of, as the enterprises grow larger, I think the needs change. Right. So the three-store pizza chain may be less concerned about security. They may be less concerned about compliance or control or things like that. But actually, so so let me step back and let me redefine. I actually think when I'm talking about the enterprise, it would be probably more akin to a, a larger organization, right, that starts to, to run into some of these challenges or constraints on, in areas like security, like control, like, like things of that nature. So if I was to ask you, Yeah, I, I don't. That's what I think of as an enterprise. I think of companies like, you know, IBM, Microsoft, HP. Yep. I don't think of necessarily that three person or that three store pizza joint as an enterprise in the in the classic sense. I think um, for the purposes of what I'm I'm contemplating here, I think that I've kind of abstracted at a level, but you know. I, some of the characteristics that I'll speak to here that I think represent the enterprise, I think some of them will align to the three-store pizza joint. I mean, so there's a great example. You know, they may want a solution to address their business needs. We want to get our menu out there. We want to be able to publish our hours and our phone number so that, you know, people, people know how to contact us and how to get a hold of us, right? Um, some of these things will align to them, but, but 
really, I think, in terms of the context in which I'm approaching this, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit larger than that as well, right? So it doesn't have to be large global international organization, but certainly some of the things that I'm, I'm going to speak to as we, when we go through these characteristics, I think it'll give you a better sense of, um, I think it's typically going to be large organizations, so, you know, more than, you know, 1,000, 2,000 employees. It doesn't necessarily have to be international or global, but, um, but they're going to be facing some of these challenges and some of these some of these situations. Yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of what they value, what, what enterprises value, so certainly I, I think I just touched on this, but solutions to address business needs. You know, enter, an enterprise is a business, and at the end of the day, they've got some mission and something they're driving to, and in order to do that more effectively, they need solutions to address their business needs. They value that. But, you know, coming to the point I think somebody brought up earlier, always interweaved with that is ROI. So what, what value can this deliver to the business and what sort of return is there? Um, you know, I, I have yet to run into an organization that just takes on technology projects because they're fun. Um, there's always some sort of, it's, it, it's in response to some sort of a business need and in almost every case, not every, but almost every case, they're actually looking at understanding what the ROI is. You know, I've worked with some organizations that go so far as to, Every technology project that they have that's over, I think it was over $50,000, they had to justify with an ROI business case, and they actually had to track the metrics throughout the engagement and formally report that at the end of the engagement, and they tracked this you know, repeatedly as they would engage on, on, on different projects throughout the organization. Um, it, it was really interesting to see how they approach that and how it changed their thinking throughout the, the project and throughout the process. Um, some are less formal than that, but, but certainly I think that's a, that's a real um, core value of the enterprise. Um, we actually heard this morning from uh, the CIO of Whole Foods in, in Dries' keynote about one of the points that he touched on was speed to market, right? Speed to market is important for enterprises. Um, you know, they, they, competitive advantage, uh, being able to deliver in a, in a quickly, in a way that quickly is responsive to, to market needs. Speed to market is often a, a very important point. Um, another point that, that actually he touched on in the keynote, the CIO of Whole Foods, was flexibility. Um, so often, a lot of organizations are constrained. They may be constrained in terms of budget. They may be constrained in terms of internal, you know, compliance and processes and things they have to align under, and they, wherever possible, they need some range of flexibility to, to meet their customers' needs and to, to provide these business solutions. So flexibility is, is really something that's of great value to, to enterprises. Um, I, I mentioned compliance, and I think, you know, the, you'd mentioned this, the gentleman back there had mentioned it in terms of controls. Um, compliance can, can be on a number of levels. I've seen compliance be, uh, you know, important or required within an enterprise at the IT level, certainly in terms of um, what, you know, what technologies can you leverage within a given enterprise. Um, compliance in terms of security standards or different standards that the organization has. But I've also seen compliance from a business standpoint. So um, certainly with, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley and the introduction to that, I've seen a lot of situations where enterprises have to, um, through technologies that they're implementing, they are implementing controls and business controls and things like segregation of duties and leveraging these systems to document those types of things. So, so compliance is something that as you get into, this is where it's the, you know, not so important to the three-person three pizza joint down the street, but as you get into large organizations, compliance becomes more and more important. Uh, security, I think that's that's almost a no-brainer, right? I don't know of any organization, um, regardless of their business mission, that doesn't have some interest and or concern about security today. And, and we see it, you know, we see it in the news. We see, you know, Target. Uh, I think the latest data breach was um, was with eBay, actually, with uh, them exposing some credit card numbers or some other, perhaps, no, it was accounts. It was accounts and passwords, right? But security is always in the news. It's always in the front of, of, of folks' mind folks minds from an enterprise perspective and then the other one that, that was also mentioned out here scale right there are while there are some businesses out there that are not interested in growth you know most of them and most organizations I've been involved in are they have a mission and they're trying to drive that mission and they're looking to grow and they need to scale and they need they need solutions and technologies that can scale effectively with them so so that that I think um, I think it, it aligns well to some of the ideas and some of the things that, that were coming out in, in the discussion there in the audience. So now let's think about between the enterprise and the Drupal list, what kind of alignment do we have? You know, we'll try a, a simple Venn diagram, right? So, 
you know, and I think about some of the aspects that are important to the Drupalists, like community, um, cool technology. You know, they, those don't necessarily immediately, as you look at it, they don't pop up at you, and, and you don't immediately say, "Oh, yeah, those those align pretty well to what the enterprise is looking for as well." And vice versa on the other side, you know, speed to market and compliance. Well, those aren't always going to bubble right to the top of the list of, of overlapping there either and, and good alignment there either. I think the ones that immediately come to mind at a high level are going to be value. So, so Drupalists want to make a difference. They want to provide something of value. And enterprises are always on the lookout for value. They're, they're, they have a different term for value. They would call it ROI, right? They would, they would derive their value in that way. And certainly both are looking interested in solutions to challenging problems, maybe from different perspectives, but, but well, certainly looking for solutions to those problems. But you know, as we, as we explore this conversation further, I think some of these other aspects will actually start to come into a little bit more alignment, not just the ones that are immediately appearing to, to have some overlap there. So I'll get to the heart of it now, you know, my, my perspective on why I think the enterprise needs Drupal. Um, so I think some of these things, if, if you've been around the Drupal space, some of these things might just pop off at you as you know, kind of being obvious. Um, some of these things hopefully aren't so obvious. Um, I tried to, to pull this together considering the, the different, level, different types of attendees we have here at DrupalCon. You know, some, some who are learning more about Drupal and maybe looking to take some information back to, you know, to their um, stakeholders and their business. Some who are learning more about getting involved in the community and otherwise. So um, hopefully this gives kind of a, a broader spectrum. But I, I really think you know, when we think about solutions to business needs for the enterprise, open source, the openness of Drupal is really, really critical. Um, it, it, it is not limiting, right? It is open, it provides flexibility. You can integrate it, you can, you can modify it, you can tweak it, you can adjust it to, to really meet your needs and to, to deliver the type of solution that you need um, to address your business needs. Um, certainly, as, as folks are, are jumping in and they're trying to, to look at solutions to address their business needs, one thing that, that people are always interested in, and whether it's proprietary software or open source software, they are always interested in, how do I get a head start? How do I jump ahead? You know, I've worked at some of the proprietary software companies I've worked at, you know, sold technologies like ERP-related technologies and mobile technologies, and one of the first things that customers or prospective customers would always ask when you come into a conversation is, well, this is really interesting technology, but you know, do you have any pre-built components? Are there pre-built kind of solutions that I can leverage? You know, whether I can just leverage them out of the box or whether it's kind of a starting point that I can then build on top of. No one, no one wants to reinvent the wheel. Nobody wants to, to start building something completely bespoke from the ground up. So, so this concept of having you know, the modules out there within the community, the contributed modules, uh, being able to leverage those, those, those pre-built features even if you're not going to leverage them, you know, stock as is, and you're going to be tweaking or adjusting them slightly, that having that head start is really, really critical for uh, for the enterprise. And we've heard earlier vendor lock-in. I think this is a really important aspect, and you're going to see that iterated on a, on a couple of points here in a couple of slides. But um, I have I have seen on a number of occasions um, organizations, and I actually I've been on the other side of this where I've been working to provide solutions proprietary solutions to enterprises that lock people in. The technology is a lock-in, right? And at, ultimately, what that means is when the organization decides at some point that they want to shift and take a different direction, either maybe the product was not evolving to, to their satisfaction or, um, or that they weren't happy with the level of support they were needing, or maybe even what happens more commonly is their needs change. And the product that they thought would be a great product for them in the long, you know, in the long term it actually ends up only working for the short term, and they have to shift directions, shift technologies, look at a new product. And when you have a situation with vendor lock-in, oftentimes it's like, well, toss that out the door. Let's let's start over. You know, let's let's look at things afresh. So, you know, with, without having that vendor lock-in and that proprietary um, technology, that that's really of great great value to uh, to the enterprise. Certainly, uh, I think is is a is a great. Um, a great example of why the enterprise needs Drupal. So let's. I don't think so. Um, 
I don't think that Acquia is is in. If you there may be examples where you'd say if you're hosting with Acquia, and let's say Acquia you know shuts out the lights and turns things off, sure you'd have to figure out how you're going to move you know your site to another hosting provider. But I don't think there's anything within Drupal itself that is is so locked in or proprietary to any any one organization. Yeah, and, and theoretically, if this, let's just say we are locked in, let's just say I could, if I could go away, we'd be in trouble, then I as an enterprise customer would have to go to my source code and read the file, and as an enterprise customer, that's not what I'm going to, that's not what I'm going to do. Okay. Because the reason as an enterprise customer you pick a technology and you avoid vendor lock-in is because you don't ever want to read the file and go to even if you have to. Yep. Well, I think... What's different in this situation is when you get into an enter like a lock-in type situation. I mean, you get into situations like where, you know, you you work with you work with proprietary vendors, right? So I'm going to guess as part of your contract, you're asking them, you're saying, hey, I want source code escrow, right? I want to make sure that if you go under or you go away, I've got some means to recover from that. Well, the great thing, even if you had a situation where that that vendor went under and you went to you know the escrow account, and you pulled the source code out, what are you going to do with it? I mean, but the difference, but the difference here, the difference here is, you know, you have the code, right? It's it's open source. You have the code, and it's not just one firm like Acquia that can that can help you work with it. It's it's a whole community of people. It's it's hundreds of firms that are out there that can, you know. When you look at that, um, that ecosystem, it's yeah. Acquia. That's what, let's just say three hundred people, and a whole bunch of much much smaller. And let's just say I had I had put all my trust in Acquia and I had I was going to think about two thousand sites that Acquia was managing. Yeah. If Acquia was to go away, I would probably consume the resources of ten of those smaller companies. Well, I, it, I don't think it's really viable. I don't think you, you I don't think you can actually do it. Right. I think the market is healthy. I, I think I, I would no, agree. So I would say. The is healthy, and there are lots of capable agencies. But they are all super busy. And there's nothing Acquia is doing for you that's proprietary. So I well, actually, actually, I'm, I'm, and this is an kind of emergency situation. We haven't gone on Acquia, but I do yeah. think Acquia's dominance in this marketplace is dangerous. But it's not. Yeah. Blocking. I think that's the point where. Um, right. The bullet yes. So, so, and I would also say that I think, you know, as an example, Blink, you know, we, we currently have right in the neighborhood about 80 employees, right? We're continuing to grow. We expect to be closer to 120 employees by the end of the year. We're not alone in that, right? Drupal firms are growing. The community is growing. And I think that there's going to, I do think there's, there's, you might be surprised in terms of the degree of capacity beyond just one firm, beyond Acquia that's out there to, to uh, offer every, services every and to support you. growing to meet demand that's there. Mm -hmm. They're not building Well, but I, I think the talent shortage, so that, that's probably a topic for a separate discussion, but I believe there are things afoot and things happening that are going to help address the talent shortage, both in terms of as, as the technology improves, as we move to Drupal 8, as, as training improves, as education improves. I think there are a lot of things happening. If there's more and more demand, there's going to be more and more supply. I think that's just, that's, that's the nature of it. And one thing that I might say about that, I'm a vanilla experience with Symphony 2 and that whole realm of things, I would not have looked at Drupal. I would not be here if there was no DA on the map. Uh, so that may be, uh, y'all may be underestimating the amount of um, supply side impact that Drupal 8 and the reliance on, uh, well, the, the, the not invented here issue going down a bit and being um, um, using more widely accepted components. Okay. So, um, well, well, I think it's a, I mean, it's a good point. It's a good discussion point. In fact, I'd even be willing to give you a Reese's cup for it. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you one because you answered one of my questions. Oh, I did. Well, good. I'm glad I, I'm glad I could, but I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards if you'd like more. Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, there, there's no question about it. I think that um, I think Acqui has been very, very – played a critical role in terms of helping enterprises to be able to start to make that move and make that transition. And, you know, in full disclosure, I used to work at Acquia, so I, I, I don't um, I don't argue with, with, with that point at all. I think that's, I, a, that's I a very good point. But, yeah. That's not actually an answer that's going to make my CTO terribly happy because mm -hmm. he wants to hear there are three large companies of the same size who will compete for for the business to, mm -hmm. to fill that hole. Not that he's got to figure out how to manage 80 companies and parcel out work along with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's That's fair, but I, I also I do think the, the community is continuing to evolve, right? And I think the, the ecosystem is continuing to evolve. So we should, I'd, I'd love to talk further with yeah, you to, to, to expand on that further, but yeah. You bet. But hey, we'll, we'll get you another Reese's Cup later. Um, so let's talk about ROI and why the business needs needs Drupal or why the enterprise needs Drupal from an ROI standpoint. So I, I think, you know, for, you always have to look at cost, right? Open source, free. But is it really free, right? People are going to, you know, we'll always hear the discussion and the argument that I think is totally valid, which is, well, the software is free, but I have to, you know, I have to pay for implementation services. I have to pay for hosting. You know, I have to. There, there is a there is a cost associated with it, and that is that is absolutely and undeniably true. Um, however, you know, I've I've been on the other side of this coin. Um, even with proprietary software solutions, even if you took away the software cost, those costs still exist, right? Within within the enterprise, you still have to host. You still have to to uh, do implementations, and when you get into any sort of more complex software that's supporting the enterprise, uh, it's it's pretty common that you're either going to have to hire talent in house to be able to, to handle that, or to go outside and contract with with other re third party resources to uh, to be able to handle those implementations. So, when we talk about the prices right being free, it's not the you know the implementation, the hosting, things like that are never free, but it's the the, the software itself. You're not paying upfront license fees, you're not playing, paying annual maintenance fees on an ongoing basis. So I think that's a, that's a very important consideration, especially when you start to look at it from the perspective of an enterprise. I, 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 I sold software, to, large software packages to enterprises. I know how much enterprises spend on license fees and on, on maintenance fees, and it's, it, it can be a substantial amount. Um, I've already just spoken briefly to the, to the ongoing cost of maintenance. I think relative to certainly there's the reduction and there's, there's no maintenance fees associated with a software license for, for Drupal, but maybe even more importantly here is as you think about the ongoing kind of, kind of uh, uh, maintenance of Drupal and the iteration on Drupal, you know, if, if you think about, think about Drupal and the Drupal community as think about it in terms of if it were a, if it were a software company and a software organization. Right. Think about the number of hours that go into to patches, to updates, to new modules that are being contributed. Pull that all together. I don't know what that number is, but I know it's a big number in terms of the number of hours. And if you consider that the R and D investment that goes into Drupal, I think you'd be challenged to find any software company on the planet that is investing that same amount of hours into ongoing R and D around a, 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 a product line that they that they've launched. I mean. You know, I, I think you'd even be stretched to say that companies like Oracle, you know, are, are achieving that kind of scale. So um, I think that's important because the the benefit coming out of that is the the ongoing level of innovation and and the level of of, of change and, and updates to the technology that are coming out of the community are, are very very important as you think about the ongoing cost of maintenance. Um, I, I mentioned innovation here as well. I think you know this is. I had heard this analogy, the one I just provided to you, made a few years ago, and it always sticks with me as you think about how many hours are going into investing. People's, people's times, you know, nights, weekends. I know people who, you know, are part of the Drupal community because they're passionate about Drupal. They'll go home on a Saturday night and they'll, you know, hump, hop in and, and, and start working on, uh, on their module, right, or working on something else. And there's just, there's, there's, uh, it's incredible the degree of contribution that goes in and what that actually means tangibly when you think about it in terms of the hours invested into Drupal and into the technology that we all can benefit from. Again, coming back to this point, 
we, I think we sufficiently talked through this one earlier, but you know, I think the, the November lock-in from an from an investment standpoint is also an important consideration. But we can also we can talk later about that. Um, speed to market, another another important point. So I mentioned earlier, you know, this concept, the, the pre-built modules, the contributed modules that are out there, um, the fact that you know you you have a starting point, even if the features that you need out of the modules aren't aren't you know exactly they don't work exactly the way you want, you've got a starting point and you can take it and, and, and build on it from there. Um, certainly in terms of speed to market, as you think about you know, new technologies that are coming into the market, new, new systems or sites that you need to integrate with, right? Um, the, the speed in which the, the community is, is producing modules that can allow you to leverage those new technologies to, to integrate with those, those new systems or those new solutions, um, it's really quite remarkable. And you know, this actually this speaks to the point. Some of the discussion we were having earlier, the variety of resources on the market that are able to to help you support you with with Drupal and help you to implement. You know, you, you can see it here. You go down on the floor and you see all the different all the different firms that have booths and how many more people are attending that that work with organizations to help them with Drupal either on a you know independent consulting basis or otherwise. You know, they don't even have booths, but there's so many more people here in attendance that that are working and, and offering services around Drupal. You know, I, I think back to, I, I had one particular company, a proprietary company that I worked at, where we had a solution that we would offer, and I remember I was engaging, it was with, with, with GE. We were engaged on a call, and they said, as they were looking at buying our software up front, they said, well, we'd like to, you know, we know we're going to need consulting services to implement this, but, and, and we'd, we'd like to use your services, but boy, they're, they're kind of expensive. You know, do you have anybody else who, who implements this who you could recommend? And the answer was, well, we have this partner that we sort of have trained on it, but you know they sort of know it. They don't. They're probably going to have to engage us in the back end. But you could talk to them. I mean, what I was, what we were basically telling them is, you don't have any other options. We're the only game in town, and so, you know, if you think we're too expensive, hey, I'm sorry. With it, that's all we've got, right? Um, you, if you look out at the Drupal ecosystem here, and and just the variety of options and and the different resources that you have available to you to to be able to leverage for Drupal, I think that's of great great value to the enterprise. Um, the ecosystem is is very very healthy, and and certainly taking that a step further. So built up around that, you know, you talk about companies like Acquia, but there's o there's other companies as well. You know, um, uh, you know, hosting offerings from Pantheon and Black Mesh and and Rackspace. Um, other other solution offerings that are that are coming to the table, you know, I think um, uh, Open SaaS was one I recently heard about with uh, New Civic and, and uh, uh, coming to the table with New Civic and Acquia. Um, these are all solutions that are that are either available on the market or are coming to the market that can actually help you to accelerate that pace further, to give you that 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 ability to start one step ahead and, and to jump in uh, uh, one step ahead of things. Again, helping with the speed to market and certainly flexibility. Um, this is always a, a very important point, you know, integration. I, I can't say enough about integration. You're going to see that iterated a, to, at, a, at a couple different points throughout here. Um, I uh, spent some time, I've worked with a number of insurance companies um, in the past. Uh, one that comes to mind is Allstate Insurance. Anybody here work for Allstate? No, nobody from Allstate. Well, Allstate's an interesting company in that they, they're pretty forward thinking in terms of some of the technologies that they're trying to leverage, but Allstate, like pretty much every other insurance company I've ever worked with, they have legacy systems, mainframe systems that are not going away. Um, these, these are systems that they've been using for years and years and years to support their insurance business. And so they are, they are not going to look at technologies or solutions that cannot integrate. Integration is so, so important. And, and you would think, you know, who's going to go back and integrate with mainframe systems? Well, it's companies like Allstate and Nationwide and, you know, the, the big insurance firms. And that's just one example of one industry. I'm quite confident you can see that it, it, across a variety of different industries. You can see that occurring. Um, you know, the best thing about Drupal is if you don't like it, you can change it. You've got the source code. You can change it. But you want to make sure you change it in the right way. Right? That's always important, to do it the right way. Don't, as it, the, old, the old tagline of don't hack core. Um, one other element that I think is, is sometimes maybe overlooked that I think is just having a little bit different perspective is, is, is important is the separation of the theming and the presentation layer from the configuration and the features layer. You know, I, I've had, uh, I, I can recall a specific conversation when I was, again, working with a proprietary software company, to, not to be named, um, that, that we had a customer we were working with, we were building a mobile app. And the mobile app, 
we had laid out a number of different fields on a form on a screen and the customer said, gee, I'd really like to be able to change and, and change the way in this, which this field on the form is displayed, right? And I remember the conversation being, and they just want a very, very small change and the conversation went to, well, that's kind of just the way our software works and we could probably give you the ability to capture that additional field of data that you're looking for, but we have to reconfigure the, the screen and use this different feature and you know, all they wanted to do was make this one little tiny change in the screen and yet sometimes you know, because of the way the proprietary technology is developed, there wasn't that flexibility. So again, this is something that I think is really important with Drupal, that, that degree of flexibility, even down to the level of being able to tweak or tune or adjust the presentation in any way you need it. It's, it's very important. So. I think I've belabored enough in terms of why the enterprise needs Drupal. Let's talk a little bit about why Drupal needs the enterprise. I think this is, this is just as important and sometimes maybe not as immediately clear. So community, we talked about community as being very, very important to the Drupalist. And I think it's, it's critical to, to Drupal overall. The health of the community is, is, is critical. And I'm, I'm a big believer that, that Enterprises are critical to providing that capital to continue to keep the community vibrant. So are they directly infusing capital and, and money into the community itself? Well, most of the time, no. In some situations they are, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but most of the time, enterprises are leveraging Drupal and you know, they may be engaging a firm like a company like Acquia or, or you know, a firm like Blink Reaction to, to help them with their, their Drupal sites and the Drupal work that they're doing. Um, and those communities, those those organizations, in turn, are supporting the Drupal the Drupal community. They are uh, bringing more Drupalists on board and, and creating more more um, more more people within the Drupal community. But also, I think what's happening is organizations, in a lot of cases, are going out and they're investing internally to to bring Drupal developers on board. Right? They're they're paying for those developers to come on board. People are the jobs are being created, and and this is all then kind of you know jobs are being created people then find that, hey, I can get paid to work on Drupal, all of a sudden there's more and more interest in, in you know, driving and building the community. And I think, you know, again, that, that investment that's flowing back indirectly through the, through the, from the enterprises through, through organizations or through individuals back into the community is really, really important. Um, and, and that also in turn then helps to fuel the continued growth of the community. The community needs to continue to grow. And that growth is going to be accomplished by, you know, more and more people using Drupal, hiring more Drupalists, you know, engaging more, more Drupal organizations, um, more Drupal services companies. Um, that's going to continue to be, it, it's, it's a sort of a, a virtuous circle, if you will, in terms of how that all flows together. And I think that enterprises are, are a key, key component to the health of the Drupal community. Um, another thing that I think is in, important is that you know, once enterprises introduce technology into their organization, they start to leverage technology, all of a sudden there's a tail on that technology. Um, you know, if we were, let's, I mean, let's imagine a world, this, is, this won't happen, but let's imagine a worst case world where as of today, no enterprises would, would do any more projects going forward on Drupal, right? There's no more Drupal work. There's still a tail on that because enterprises, when they implement solutions leveraging technologies, those can be sticky. I mean, I, I was in, in discussion with an organization last week that's still leveraging Drupal 5 sites, right? And now they haven't had a, a compelling business need to go out and update them or change them. Um, though I think, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons why they may want to lift, uplift them or, or do that. But, but, but the fact that those sites have been built and they're continuing to be utilized and serve a function and a purpose, there's, there's a tail that gets created here. And, and it, it just, it continues to, to, lengthen that tail on the Drupal community. So I do think, you know, these are sort of um, kind of concepts of, of they're, they're, not, they're not always directly apparent, but I do think enterprises play a key role in, in the health of the, the overall Drupal community. You know, when you think about solutions to problems, how do, how, why does Drupal need the enterprise for solutions to problems? Well, I think we've seen examples over the past, you know, three, four years of situations where Drupal has run into some sticky problems, some challenging problems, scaling, performance, you know, things of that nature. And it's not always the case, but it's quite often that what's pushing that envelope and what's, what's pushing Drupal to, to solve those challenges and to solve those problems is often 
enterprise challenges and enterprise needs. Hey, we need to be able to handle more page views. We need to be able to, to scale faster. We need to be able to manage more sites. Right? And that's, that's, that's speeding the, the overall uh, solutions to those problems, but also the innovation, the rate at which that innovation is occurring. Now, would that innovation and would that problem solving occur independent of the enterprises? Yeah, it may, but uh, my argument is it's, it, the enterprise plays a great role in accelerating that and helping to drive that forward. And I think that's, that's really critical for, for Drupal. And, and certainly comes back to, to integration as well, right? The more, you know, you even saw it in, in Dries's keynote this morning in terms of his vision for, for where Drupal is headed and where the web is headed, right? Integration is, is really a, a key, key component to all of this. And last but not least, making a difference. So, so why does Drupal need the enterprise in terms of thinking about it from the perspective of making a difference? Well, in a lot of cases, the enterprise is, is opening up and exposing opportunities for Drupal to provide value and to make an impact, right? For people to be able to see an example of, hey, look, look at how my module is being used out there and, and what great use it's being put to and how people are achieving value from it. Um, look, at, uh, look at examples of, um, you know, as you think about the, the businesses and they're generating ROI, they're, they're getting returns from their use of Drupal. Um, in many cases, what they gonna, they're not just going to say, oh, that was great, and we're going to move on to some other technology. They're going to look at this, and they're going to say, we've really seen some very demonstrable returns out of this. We're going to continue to invest in Drupal. Drupal usage continues to grow, and that just increases the growth of an investment into the Drupal community per you know, kind of this concept of the virtuous circle that I was talking about earlier. So Reese's Cups comes back to Reese's Cups. Does anybody remember the commercial from the 70s? Or probably not the 70s, the 80s, right? You got your chocolate and my peanut butter. You got my, my peanut butters in your chocolate. Um, let's see if this works. We'll even do a little. Uh... Oh, hey, you got chocolate on my peanut butter. You got peanut butter on my chocolate. So, so I like this analogy because as you think about it, Drupal and the enterprise are like chocolate and peanut butter. Right? I'm not going to say which is which. You can you can figure out which which is chocolate, which is peanut butter. But but I really think. You know, you don't necessarily logically always think of these things, two things, as, as working well together and, and being, uh, you know, being very tasty together, but they certainly are. They certainly are. So a couple of ideas. I've, I've got a few minutes left, and I want to just spend a, a few minutes talking about ways that, that I think are important for Drupal to continue supporting the enterprise and, and vice versa. Um, I won't belabor these points, but I think they're important. So one is I think Drupal needs to continue innovating. Um, you know, I think that's, that's been key to, to the success of Drupal to date, and I think it's going to be critical to, to the success of Drupal going forward with Drupal 8 and beyond. Um, you know, that, that comes right hand in hand with a key element of that is the growth of the community and the pace of the growth of the community. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, integration. Integration, integration, integration. So open systems play very, very nicely together. Um, however, they also need to play very, very nicely with closed systems, so leveraging standards, right? Um, more and more enterprises are going to be able to, to take Drupal and leverage Drupal the more they can easily integrate it with, you know, not just some other proprietary systems they have, but even these, you know, the example of the Allstate, the, the, uh, the claim system that they're using, this old, you know, legacy uh, uh, proprietary mainframe system. Um, growth, I think the growth continuing to find ways to grow the community is, is really, really important um, for some of the points that we talked about earlier. And somebody made the point of quality earlier in the back. Right there, all right. So quality is critical, right? If, if you think about ways that Dru the Drupal community and Drupal can support the enterprise, it's quality, it's, it's being rigorous about security, it's being rigorous about performance, keeping those things in mind. Um, really, really important. And last but not least, this point's for Ray, because I knew he'd like this, educate. Educate. I, I can't tell you um, there's, there's, there's not a great understanding, pervasive understanding of Drupal, you know, across enterprise organizations. 
Um, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And the best way I think we can overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt is through education. It's by engaging in conversation, by, um, by, by helping to dispel myths, and, and helping people to be informed and make informed decisions. So I think that's, that's an important way in which Drupal can help to support the enterprises through ongoing education. So let's talk about how the enterprise can support Drupal. You know, I was sitting down with one of our customers the other day, um, and this is a big, big enterprise customer. Um, they are on the cusp of, of commencing a migration um, to a new Drupal platform that includes, I think, in, in total, initially it's going to include like maybe 500 sites this year, and I think it's going to range up closer to 3,000 um, over the next couple of years. And they as, they, as we were having this discussion, they said, you know, gee, we've been thinking a lot about how we're leveraging Drupal and how we're really taking away some, some of the benefits of Drupal, but we really need to start thinking as an organization about ways that we can give back and how can we give back. Um, you know, it's not just a, you know, a one-way street. And I think, you know, one, one aspect is not being afraid to contribute code back to the community. There are great examples of how this has happened. Um, I remember a few years ago, the White House, right? They, uh, the White House had contributed back a number of modules that they had, had developed for the whitehouse.gov site. A um, great example I can remember is um, a couple, couple of organizations ago, I had a consultant that, that was on my team that was working with Thomson Reuters. And he was building a site for Thomson Reuters where he needed a, a particular feature where he could do, it's kind of a table where he could do inline editing in a Drupal site. And so he, he whipped up this little simple mod, module he called Table Views. And it was at the beginning of the project. He, he put it out, he contributed it, and you know, continued down the project with Thompson. And when they came to the end of the project, all of a sudden, you know, he was, uh, he was kind of doing some cleanup, and he went out and he looked on Drupal.org, and all of a sudden, you know, not only had a couple bugs been fixed by other people who had grabbed the module and started using it within the community, they would fixed some bugs, but they had also added some new features to it. And he's able to look at that and take that and pull that down and, and take advantage of that in the site that he was building for Thompson. So things like, stories like that, that, that happens. I mean, that, that stuff is real, and that's just, you know, one example from my personal experience, but there may be others in the room who can speak to examples like that. So contributing code can have some, some real benefits. Um, getting involved. So getting involved can be, can be really simple. Um, it can be as simple as hosting a local meetup. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, sponsoring a Drupal camp, right? Uh, you know, when, when you have these local meetups or these local uh, or regional Drupal camps, you know, I think the, those, the, the people who are attending, you know, in order to defray the cost, they rely on, you know, some of the sponsorships to be able to, you know, help pay for lunch or help to cover some of the cost of the facilities or things like that. And uh, that can make a real difference. There are also some, some initiatives underway in which, you know, if you've got some very specific needs or specific focus, you know, one specific initiative I'll call out that, that Aqua is driving is this large-scale Drupal initiative. Um, and, you know, if you're an enterprise and you're focused on, on scale and performance, um, what they're doing is they're working with organizations to, to invest to help, again, solve some of these stickier, more challenging issues associated with, with scaling Drupal. Um, so if, if that's something that's of, of importance to you, um, that, that might be worth looking into. Um, and last but not least again on the part of the enterprise is education right being able to to educate and engage both both educate internal employees and people and stakeholders within your organization but also you know understanding what the options are that are out there with Drupal how do you engage the right developers the right partners and how do you make good decisions when it comes to Drupal so these are all things i think that that in ways in which enterprises can can make take steps or, or, or make decisions to, to help better support Drupal. And at the end of the day, just remember, it's all about the chocolate and the peanut butter, the Reese's Cup. They go great together. So, so with that, for those who didn't contribute ideas during the discussion, I'm happy to take questions, but I also have more Reese's Cups. I think, Ray, do you have some as well? So feel free if you want some Reese's Cups. You're welcome to come up and grab some. So I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, so I'm a back-end developer, been a back-end developer for six years, and yep. I've noticed that a lot of my clients are more enterprise-based clients, and I was wondering from your perspective if a freelancer wanted to serve the enterprise market, mm -hmm. what they should specialize in instead of joining some big firm, they can just do it themselves. So, um, when you, so back-end, are you doing site building, or are you doing custom module development? Custom or module con development. Like yeah. What role does a freelancer have in serving the, the enterprise market? So you'd be surprised at how many organizations are looking for people just like you. Um, you know, I think um, 
there are organizations that are looking to either either contract on an individual basis or hire, you know, as, as employees, um, people who have specific skills in those areas. Um, ways in which you might go about doing that, I think, um, certainly is just, uh, you know, a lot of times there's there's you know ads put out employment ads or contracting ads people reaching out trying to trying to find organizations i've also found that um as i've so i'm from the boston area uh, i don't know if what area are you from san francisco oh yeah so drupal meetups great place to go because when you get to a meetup you're going to have people coming in and saying i'm just learning about drupal my my company wants to build a site on drupal but we're struggling with how do we find the resources how do we find the talent I, at least at the boston area meetup i've seen that happen n numerous times and yeah, it's a, and I would also add, yep I think go ahead ray a, a lot of shops and, and we don't we don't do it very often but there are a lot of shops that would love to have a really great working relationship um with, with a Enterprise and the and enterprise providers this is always a question of managing risk at some point there. So I think the key idea would find a shop where you're a good match and you don't have to work them full time to build a relationship with them. Try to meet a need that maybe they don't have you know the resources to, to meet themselves on an everyday basis. Well, so let me rephrase my question a little bit. So there's a lot of profits in the enterprise market. That's where the higher rates are. Mm -hmm. And being a large shop like Link, Link Reaction or Aquia, mm -hmm. um, it's, you guys have more resources, more talent, mm -hmm. more specialty, and, and thus more security as well, and you can justify those rates. Mm -hmm. But as a freelancer, I think getting into that mix as well and also charging those rates is something very attractive for freelancers to do while subcontracting you always got to cut a piece of the pie out of there and so it's a little sure. bit lower yeah so if a freelancer wanted to charge the rates of large firms like what specialties or roles do you think they could I, invest in invincibility Really tough right, so those yeah. are the, the roles that make a freelancer not attractive. So which ones would make them attractive? Well, That's I'll, the question. I'll, I'll tell you, though, I also think it's, you know, freelancers being attractive, not attractive. I think part of it is also dependent on the work that you've done in the past and, and what you can point to in terms of, you know, the value that you can bring to the organization. Um, those risks are absolutely there, and that, that will be a detriment to you as you're trying to engage in that way. But also, I mean, I, I, I've seen two-person shops that can go and, and command rates as high as anybody else in the Drupal space um, because they are they, they are very, very good at what they do and they can point to, you know, some of the successes they've had and the clients they've worked with as, as great examples of the value that they can bring. So um, it's not, there's not a simple answer, but, um, but I would encourage you, I mean, it, Getting connected and trying to, to establish and get some experience. Once you get a few a few clients that you can point to under your belt and a few successful projects, that that makes a big difference. Um, Great, thank yeah. you. Yep. Yeah. Good. Any other questions or topics for discussion? I got another. Yep. Is it is it about is it about lock-in? Uh, no, it's no, not okay. about lock-in. That was a. I do want to. No, I don't want to. Okay. That discussion. Uh, so Drupal has moved to the enterprise realm in the last especially last three years. Absolutely. What downsides have you seen because of the shift from, I guess, less enterprise to now mainly enterprise? Or more enterprise? Downsides to Drupal and the, to the... Yeah, the pros and the cons of moving toward enterprise. Specifically um, the cons. I, I think you talked a lot about the pros. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I feel there are a lot of pros. A lot of pros. And I think I, I maybe highlighted some of those. The cons. Um, you know... One thing that, that struck me four years ago when I started getting involved with Drupal and, and getting engaged with the Drupal community, um, and this is true to an extent today, Drupal for a lot of people is a lifestyle, right? Um, they, they have a lifestyle that, that and, and Drupal is a key part of that lifestyle, and that works, I think that's fantastic. And, and I know people who are part of the community today that that's still absolutely the case for, and I think that is really, really great. Um, I think that, that a lot of times those people will start lifestyle businesses. When I say lifestyle, it's it's sort of you know, they'll they'll kind of they'll work when they want to work and they'll do things that you know take on the projects they want to take on and otherwise, and and I think that that sometimes that doesn't always align and make sense 
to the enterprise. So, um, you know, that's that's an area where I see there's sometimes some some dissonance, if you will. Um, but you know, outside of that, I really I feel very strongly, and the reason I wanted to speak on this topic today is I feel very strongly that there have been a ton of benefits about uh, of Drupal and the enterprise kind of coming together and working together. Sometimes they're they're you know, very visible and tangible, and sometimes they're less tangible, less visible, but they're still there. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Does anyone have anything else? Please come get a Reese's cup. Oh, yes. What kind of changes can happen in the core and contrib work, uh, workspace to help Drupal's adoption in the enterprise? Um, I won't be able to speak to that at a detailed level. I'll tell you that right up front. Uh, I do think it comes back to this, this the, the focus that we talked about. I think there's been very, very good focus and rigor around quality, around security, around performance. I think that absolutely needs to continue. Um, I think, and I think, I'm going to talk to it. I, I'm not going to give you specific answers of specific features or specific changes or updates, but I do think the continued innovation and, and the speed of innovation there um, and, and the ability to integrate are very, very key at a, at a macro level in terms of you know. Do you think not having a predictable release timeline hurts Drupal's case? You know what's funny? So the enterprise like proprietary software companies I've worked at they'll tell you they have a predictable release cycle but you know what they never hit the release dates so so um, I I actually I'm of the opinion that really doesn't hurt Drupal a whole lot I also don't think that there are you, you tell me anybody sitting in this room waiting for Drupal 8 because you have to have it in order to launch your site I, I, I don't generally think that's the case I think there's a lot of great things coming with Drupal 8 but I also think that you know, if people have a need to build the site, they're probably jumping into Drupal 7 right now. They're not gonna. They're not gonna put you know all their eggs in that basket on the Drupal 8 date, um, and and that that uptake of Drupal 8 will be gradual, just like it was with Drupal 7, and and you know it'll really come into full force over time. But I think that this, a significant move that we heard about this morning is this move towards continuous innovation yeah. as opposed to a hollow release schedule. Uh, I would also say, in, you know, to your Point about what can we do to, to help adoption of the enterprise. I mean, a lot of it's really happening with Drupal 8. And if I could point to one single thing, yeah. it, it would be you know the resolution of some of the major problems around deployment, and the site preview uh, that are uh, just been huge problems for enterprise organizations. And organizations like Pfizer uh, and other folks have really built up their own infrastructure to support the deployment needs. Um, but for someone as a as a developer, an individual developer sort of make a, a contribution on that like, I think that looking down the line just six months a year from from now your ability to get up to speed with uh, new standards based development symphony twig you know silex other lightweight frameworks that's going to make a real difference I, I think um, you know and if there's an area of focus or even an area of focus for a freelancer you know, I, I think that there's a lot of value. So I guess kind of piggybacking on this, we've had some large government clients bring that argument to us and they ended up moving away from Drupal mostly because they were worried about adopting Drupal 7 when Drupal 8 was imminent in a year, a year ago. Yeah. And so how do we, what is your response to that? And I guess piggybacking on that, another concern they had was the drop so split branch of Drupal. So up, upgrades are a reality with technology and with software, right? Whether you're going proprietary, whether you're going open source, Drupal, or you know otherwise, you're going to face that challenge. And, and it's always the unless there are specific features of Drupal 8 that they were waiting on, there's always the next shiny object and the next great thing that's out there. Um, I, I I agree with you. I, I think you know people like to have definitive schedules and, and definitive release dates, but. It, it, it's a little, I think, too rose-colored glasses to say that in the enterprise side that, you know, they're always on this, you know, schedule and they're always hitting those dates. And sometimes they're hitting the dates, but what they do is they back down the features and, you know, you know kind of kind of carve that out. So, I, I, listen, I, I I may come across as, as sounding very down on proprietary enterprise software. I, I've had some great experiences, and I think highly of a lot of those. There's some great companies out there, but I'll tell you that um, uh, I, I'm – what I what I presented today, I really I, I believe those things. It's you know, there's a lot of great things happening with Drupal. Cool. So, Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good. 
Anything else? I want to add a couple of thoughts. It's like an engineer turned strategist and working with these clients. I think that Drupal is coming up on being at risk of being perceived as the, the slow kid in the thing come. Hmm. Uh, I guess that some of these very performance oriented newcomers like Node. Uh, and I don't, I'm like a Node skeptic. I don't think there's actually a legitimate performance difference, right? Uh, as a guy of like this other gentleman just left, I'm kind of a, I come from the straight PHP world. Performance is absolutely possible, but Drupal, Drupal 7 at least, achieves performance and relies too heavily on caching mm -hmm. performance. And we don't actually have a fast core. Mm -hmm. We have good caching things out in front of it. And I think we're, because of the rising popularity of things like Node, or faster or not, they're talking like it's faster. And the truth is, they're not relying on caches to get their performance. 